Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you guys are. This is Paresh Modiwala. I'll be your moderator for the day. I am in sunny Providence, and I'm also one of the organizers for Providence and Boston SQL Saturdays. I run the Boston User Group, and yes, I also run the Pass DBA Virtual Group. So thank you all for spending some time with us here today. Um, so today is uh, Kevin Wilkie. He's going to speak about the windowing functions uh, that we have and more about it in a minute. But thank you to our sponsors, HVR and AWS, right? And lovely smile there. And so just so you know, in the next two days, the pass early bird pricing will go up and they are pretty solid about the timelines and so on. So if you want to go ahead and book your pass summit at for under $1,400, this is a good time to do it. So please, please uh, go ahead and do that right away. And yes, you can actually, uh, what can I do here? You can just scan this one here on your phone and it'll take you directly to the website. We have what, 30 user groups now, which are virtual groups. Uh, feel free to select any of these which come in handy to your career choices including I also run the past professional development chapter. So we are having two sessions coming up there as well. You should be learning about them too. Um, further, more SQL Saturdays coming up here. Uh, I will be in Rochester this Friday and Saturday. I will be speaking there uh, for Andy, my friend Andy Levy, and a few more in Europe and one in Australia, I mean the APAC region. So and definitely connect with PASS. We look forward to your participation. So not only do you learn, but you get to network a lot, actually, with a, some awesome community. And if you are ever stuck on SQL, for example, you can just do the hashtag SQL help. And believe me, somebody will answer your question within five minutes on Twitter, or maybe 10 minutes. The key is how to ask the question in less than 280 characters and yet provide as much information. But yeah, SQL Pass uh, hashtag that is an anchor uh, handle SQL Pass and Pass community. The membership is free. Obviously, since you are here, you already know about it, but we should continue. So, so Kevin is like what a 15 year geek in SQL. Uh, he started as an accidental DBA, he's now gone through the whole hoops of promotions and career enhancements, and he's now a lead data analyst. Right, and he says he spreads the gospel of how great data can be to anyone who can listen. So I think um, that's my two minute spiel and the rightful presenter is Kevin and I will make him the presenter now. And Kevin, feel free to take it away, my friend. Thanks, Paresh. And I'll go on mute. And yes, guys, the most frequent uh, question that is asked actually, and I forgot to address that, if you have any questions, go ahead and put that in the questions box there and I am monitoring it and I will share the question almost immediately with Kevin so that uh, the context of the question is not lost so that we don't have to wait till the very end to ask the questions. So I will now shut up and give it to Kevin. Kevin, take it away, my friend. Thank you, please. Just to let everybody know this is being recorded. It'll be recorded I'll and I'll make say that. Yeah. Thank you. I'll make the um, slides and whatnot available for everyone to see when we get through. Uh, so with that, let's go on to the presentation. If I can get the right through. All right. So uh, as Brett said, I am uh, Kevin Wilkie. I have been um, working with SQL Server for over 15 years now, almost 20, sadly. Um, <coughs> I have, a, I have a cough that is lingering now, so please forgive me if I cough too close to the screen. Uh, as you can tell, I'm also a co-organizer of the DBA Fundamentals Virtual Group. Uh, if any of y'all want to go through any more uh, fundamentals uh, of DBA work, please come over and join us. We have uh, meetings fairly regularly. Uh, we, I think we do, just like the DBA group here, we do um, about every other week, sometimes more often. Um, I've also held many titles over the years, anything from SQL developer, production DBA, 
uh, performance tuning specialist, data warehouse architect, you name it, pretty much I've done it if it includes a database at some point or some fashion. All right, so with that, what are actually windowing functions? We've, we've heard some of these terms over the years and we're like, what does this mean? Well, the first thing that's most important for everyone to realize, it has nothing to do with the operating system. I bring that up because the first time I actually started talking about windowing functions, uh, the BA I was working with at the time, is like, does it have anything to do with windows? Nope, not a thing at all. Uh, the important thing to remember about windowing functions is that it really is just a function performed over a range or a window of results. Simple as that. The, the key word that you have to remember is the, the window of results that you're looking at. Uh, they've been available since SQL Server 2005. Most people don't realize they've been around that long. Um, it's thankfully it's just these four that are on the screen that were originally given to us and that we are able to work with uh, within SQL Server 2005. Um, row number, um, which is one of the most important ones that you'll actually be using. Um, I'll go over that one very specifically because I use it on a daily basis, usually um, for, for most of my queries. Uh, it, truthfully, all a row number is, is is a unique number that's over the row, it's over the window itself. Then you have rank and dense rank with deals with ties. And I'll show the difference as I go through here and give examples of how I would use both of them and the reasons why to pick one over the other. But the real difference really, the, the definition of both of them is that they both deal with ties. Then you have end tile, which is just divides rows in the bucket. So think, uh, as most of, most of people are used to working with now in Power BI, it's a histogram. It's basically putting data into uh, bins or buckets uh, to show show the data themselves. It, it's, it's within buckets within you know, within bins. Um, so with that, that gives a very quick definition of what these features do. Let's go into a demo. So I'm going to quit that, and now we show here SSMS. All right. So we're all used to this one. I'm using the AdventureWorks 2014 um, database for, for all of my demos to make it real simple, to make sure everybody can get to this data and work with it pretty simply. So here's our func first function we're actually going to work with. Uh, this is this is basically how all of them will work, will actually show. So the important thing is, for the most part, you're going to be very familiar with how to work with the data itself. The important thing here is with row number, it is row underscore number, not row number uh, all put together. It's row underscore number. Uh, then it's the open and close parentheses. So once you pop that function name in, it's, 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 that's how it's set up. Then you go into over. Over is a big, big keyword for windowing functions because like it says, it's a looking over a window. So it's just the keyword that you want to use on there is over. Uh, I believe all, well, all of the uh, winning functions that we'll go through actually use the over keyword. So it's key to remember the word over. Um, then you do another open parentheses. And in this case, we're going to, just going to be doing order by and then our field, which is customer ID in this case, then close parentheses. And I like to give it a name um, just as a best practice. Um, there are several reasons that we'll go through in, in this presentation of why we want to do that. But for now, it's pretty simple. It's, I like to keep it broken, just something called row number. Uh, you'll see a lot of people use RN. I'm in the medical healthcare field, so I tend not to use RN just because that means something different to us, but um, I like to use row number and fill most of it out. So you keep it for the same. Uh, three people and then me included will be fourth person. If you can just make that font larger from 98% to maybe, yeah, thank you. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, everybody is blessing you, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. 
All right. All right, so now I'll run this command. It's pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory. Um, just getting data from the sales dot sales order header table. Sales order ID, order date, customer ID, we're all familiar with. Row number um, is just counts. It is the exact count of row down through here, to, down to the very end. All 31,465 rows. It's just one over the other. Since we've done the order by. Now, since we all kind of have that idea in mind, what that shows, we'll add a little bit more complexity to it. Because with this, there's not a lot you can do with it. It count, it gives a count. Big whoopee. All right. So let's partition it. This will help, this will help out a little bit more. And you'll see where it's this can be very useful. So I'll run this. And you see the only difference I've done here between these two um, commands. Make it a little easier to see here. Row number, the only thing I did was add in partition by order date. So I'll run this one. And you'll see here um, for this, or this order date, now we have row number starts at one, goes down through here. There's a lot of orders being done on 531 2011. So we get down here to the next thing, which is at row 44. On 6-1, it restarts counting. So now whenever there's a break in a new new order date, it becomes, it resets it all the way to one. And we go scroll down here, we can see on 6-2, it resets to one, 6-3, resets to one. It counts all the way up till then. And yes, which it's, as you can see, it's very useful to help to see where the breaks are very quickly and you can go to the next next part itself all right so now the way i do this and i'll, I'll go again over this and show you some better ways of uh, different ways of showing the same data so as i said i'll just run this query one quickly time now the thing that most people try to do is this Right, row number equals one. This does not work. As you can tell, SSMS has already given me a thing saying, nope, can't do that. Because row number does not exist to it. So what you end up having to do is select star from, and then like all good programmers, we put it in the indent, we put that over, and now we give have to give this an alias, and now we can show that fairly quickly. And now we've just given it the first time that for this partition, for this, for the order date, for th this customer, we've given it the first customer on the list. Pretty simple. We should be able to start doing something with this now if you haven't already been using this feature. Uh, if if you haven't, if you've never seen this before, please start using the row number. It will make your life so much easier. I, I cannot stress that enough. All right, so we've got row number down. Hopefully by an hour, we should be getting to where we are pretty good with the row number. All right, so let's go into what the difference between row number rank, dense rank, and end tile itself are. All right, so as we see here, I've just put them all side by side. I don't see any real difference in just by looking at these, what the difference is. Uh, the only difference I see is in tile here has a number in here um, in the parentheses. And thankfully that is the only difference between these, how you look at that when you actually write these out. That's the only difference you'll see by them. But the important thing is when, when you look at the data itself, that it re this query will return, you'll see, you'll see some striking differences. All right, so for, for the data points we have here, sales order ID, order date, customer ID, there's no difference. It's, that still comes up the same. Row number, we've got that down. It shows one through 17, since there are 17 rows, no skips, no breaks, no nothing. Then we have rank and dense rank. Rank and dense rank are the exact same all the way down through here until we get to what still is 14 for these two. 
See, this is important because the, the date of 315 shows the same for both lines. I'll drag this out here. It's the exact same date for both lines for this one customer. And rank and dense rank are still showing as 14. So when we get to the next line that they start that they actually do differ. On 527, the rank shows as 16. So because what's happening is since it sees if these two is having the same value, then it skips 15 for rank and goes to 16. Then it continues on as normal, goes to 17. Dense rank, on the other hand, has here it has 14. It does not skip any values. It goes straight to 15 and then, then the 16. So that's the only difference between the rank and dense rank that whenever there are duplicates, then rank skips ahead however many it needs to, where dense rank does not skip any values at all. Intel, on the other hand, is like I said before, it puts it into bins. Um, in this case, what we've done is this number shows us how many bit, different bins we want to put all our data into. Then it just divides it out equally. So 17 divided by five, which would give everything, every, um, every bin at least three values. And then we come back and from starting from the top, we add one more to each until it gets, until it's, there is no more data to put into any of those bins. So that's the difference between those four. And that's kind of important because you will be using, you'll definitely be using row number a lot. Rank and dense rank, you've probably used a fair amount. In Pal, you'll, you'll see UK use cases for it, but I still do use it fairly frequently. So with that, do we have any questions for us? No questions here. I think you are doing amazingly well, so. Awesome, I like to hear that. I always love to hear back like that, how great I am. Cannot tell you enough how often I don't hear that. All right. So since we've got the basic windowing functions now, we'll get something a little bit harder. Window aggregate functions. All right, so these are functions that use aggregations without having to use group by. As you'll see in a minute, and I'll do a demo with it, it's it's basically the, the aggregate functions we're all used to, sum, count, min, average, max, things like that. You'll see it, it's, it's a little bit a different take on how that usually works. These ag window aggregate functions calculate over a window, just like our normal windowing functions. It calculates over the entire result set or over a single partition. So with that, I'll give you the basic demo and basically how you want to think about it. We now go to demo. All right, so with that, the new adventure works 2014. We're, we're, this is how we, we're all used to doing summations. Pretty simple. You get your customer ID. You look in, into whatever table. You group by it. And I did an order by just so we can keep them in, in order. Some total do. Big deal. We've all done this exact same function. Who, who knows how many times? Probably too many to count. All right. So let's do this a little differently. We can do this a little easier now. Because you'll notice here, total do, sum of total do over, so we've turned it into a windowing function. So there's no real difference between any of these here. We just call it, give it a different name. We don't, there's no group by in this case. Um, we've made it, it's, it's a little different, not, not too much, not too big a difference than normal. But now we have, all total sales for this for all customers in one very simple place. I know when I was started using uh, SSRS several years ago, and I do mean several by now, 
um, one of the big things that I wanted to, needed to do was show how much we had over time. And I could look at very quickly with this one, one function, I could get all the data and shove it into one column along with everything else. And I could, I would have been done where the way I had to do it back then, well, I had to use a temp table. We had to do this. I had to do this manipulation. It's just so much simpler now. Now, Having said that, this doesn't look all that very much useful so if all I can do is show total sales over everything. You're right. For the most part, you probably wouldn't use this often. The main thing I want to show here is if you can tell us the windowing function pretty quickly because it's, it uses the keyword over. We're used to this function. We've done this a thousand times, so I have no problems there. And with this, we, you'll see when it's blank, and I just have open and closed parentheses, I'm looking over the entire um, table, period. It, this will give me total sales. But what I can do, I can do it by, the, by each customer, since I've said now, I've said partition by customer ID. I can do the same thing I did before, and now, it gives me total sales for that one client. So let's just look at the customer 11,000 here. We've got these three orders that this person, this client has done. And we have his total sales, period. That seems pretty easy to me, at least compared to the manipulations I have done over the years and temp tables and whatnot, I can do it all in one thing. And the only thing I have to remember is to tell it over over, and then partition by this or order in order by that, much as I need to. And that's it. That's the only difference between what you've already started to use or been using for years. Well, this is probably one of the first uh, true windowing functions I ever really started to use after rule number, of course. Um, so with that, do we have any questions on this part? Because the, the aggregate functions, they're a little different because they are, we're used to aggregate, fu uh, aggregate functions, but now turning them into window aggregate functions is a little different. Hopefully everybody understands that. Parish, we still good on questions? Very good. I will interfere and intervene ruthlessly when I get a question. Awesome. All right, so with that, I can fix that, there we go, all right. All right, so that was starting with 2005. Those two, two things that I've just shown have existed since 2005. So pretty much if you're using SQL Server still today, you're probably gonna have the ability to use that. And probably most of you didn't even know that was available. It, it does happen. It, it, yeah, it tripped me up for several years before I found out, oh, I can do this now. Sweet. So there is one question immediately after I said there are no questions. So, <laughs> so the question is, can the partition have multiple columns? Yes. And I'll, I'll, I'll fill that here in a few minutes. Um, since all windowing functions work basically the same, I'll, I'll fill a couple of them with different with a number of partitions. Thank you. Oh, good question. That says your question. All right. So now, in 2008, in 2008 R2, there were no new windowing functions. Uh, SQL Server, Microsoft was actually more worried about getting SQL Server up and running the best it could. So with 2012, though, they gave us new windowing functions. There are accumulation aggregates. And I'll give a much better description here in just a minute. These accumulation aggregates allow for framing, which is a little different idea than windows themselves, just because of the way you have to look at it. And I'll go into that right now with my demo. As you see, I'll do a very demo heavy um, presentation. I like 
showing lots of demos because that's where you get the real uh, meat of this presentation. So let's go into framing itself. All right, so first thing we wanna do is a running total. Now, over the years, I've had to create many running totals and I would have used all kinds of temp tables, um, tried to go through and you name it. I've tried all kinds of multiple different tracks. This is by far the easiest I've, I can think of. So the only difference here is truly no difference. Because as you can see there, the only, the last line, let's, let's just, let's, let's make this easier on everyone. Let's actually do this so we can focus on one. Instead of having to look at 17 rows here, we'll look at just one. So for this customer, you'll notice it is ordered by order date. 621-2011, total due, 37.56. Customer running total was obviously 37.56. Next, next order, 620-2013, total due is 25.87. <coughs> Excuse me. As to the running total. Next one, just like before, 10-3-2013, we had 27.70. And the customer's running total is now 91.15. Pretty simple. Um, you get to do the same basic thing uh, that we've seen before, except there's a little difference behind the scenes because this is what you truthfully have to type on, on the screen. Get it to work. As you'll see here, because the next part I'm going to do actually has reverse rolling totals. That's a little different. And I'll also show the running total just so we can compare the two. This here is how you would have to uh, truly write a running total and a reverse rolling total. So let's focus on this part right here. This is running total. We've already seen how to do that. We're used to the sum total due over partition by, order by. All right, so now this, there's this stuff down here, it's extra. You're right, we don't normally, we don't truly have to show it, but this is what is happening behind the scenes that we do need to be aware of. So the first keyword here is rows. You can use rows or range, that is a, another example, but range is not very well created. It does have a few bugs, so I tend to stay just with rows. Then we stay between, and in this case, since I'm doing the running total, we're unbounded proceeding. Now I can change it to a different number. Let's let's say 20. I can do 20 above from where I am, because that's where it's based on your current row. But I'm going to leave it up here. It shows unbounded proceeding here. So that all unbounded proceeding means from the very top to where you are, period. And then I'll say, and current row. Just notice there's a space between current and row. I know we're, as database professionals, we're built to do either a bracket around it, an underscore, put them all together, in this case, we're doing spaces. Microsoft is, if anything, incons it's consistent on its inconsistencies. So with that, that's how, that is true. This part right here is what is truly going on behind the scenes for um, running total. Now, reverse rolling total. You gotta do something a little different. Because of how it works, <coughs> excuse me, the, we have the rows before, just like before, rows between. Now we're gonna look at the current row it's on and anything following it all the way to the bitter end. So as you'll see here, I'm gonna do the same thing I did before so we can look specifically at one customer. 
let's just run this one. We're running total. We've seen before. We all know how this works. Reverse rolling total, on the other hand, the easy way to look at it, for at least for me, if I'm trying to scroll through it, look at the total due for the very last date, 2770. Then take that total, add to 2580, add 2587 to it, and you get 5358. And then we add the 3756, and we get 9115, which thankfully ends up to the same amount that we had down here for running total. Just something to keep in mind exactly how that is all showing. Yes, this is a little different. You have to keep your mind, get your mind right with it. But you do have to keep it if you want to do reverse totals. Uh, there are a couple of other times you'll use things like this. But it's good to keep it in mind how to make that happen. All right. So now we have our reverse rolling total. And I'll remove that section here. Right, that works fine. So now let's do something that's actually kind of useful, a rolling average. This one, um, let me show a part, a part with some of the CTE here. So we can look at our, all of our data. You just grabbing the order date, the sum of the order quantities. So how many there actually are were bought on this date, a petition by the order date. So this actually shows uh, between these two tables, it shows every order and how many there was ordered on that date by anybody. So these are good things to know for the company. All right, so now we wanna show within our real query, the order date, the order quantity, which is this summation, this aggregation summation. We wanna look at the average over and then we just, or is ordering it by the order date. So that's, that's where it'll show all the data we have. And it rose between 10 preceding and 10 following. So let me show you, let's run this query and I'll show you what it does. All right, so on 531, we have our first, we've created the company, we're doing all our orders. We have 825. So our moving average, it, our rolling average is 78 because you take, as we've listed here, 10, 10 preceding, so 10 rows above, and as you see here, 10 rows below. So anything from this row down through this row are added together and then averaged to see what the, the rolling average is. Very definition of what a rolling average is. As you see here, it drops off significantly. Now on this one, on 611 here, we have an average of four on both on the moving average. That's because, as we see here, the 10 preceding, is it will look up at row two and then down to row 21 to get the actual to see what all the numbers are. So, to the question just came up. I thought I answered it, but uh, Jiri Dolaza is not clear on this. So, he's wondering in the previous example of the running totals that we have, uh, he says, why are we just not using simple totals? And yes, if what was the difference between the normal aggregation example in the previous section? He, uh, Jiri could not identify the difference. So, do we have time for that now, or? Sure. Let, let me let me finish real quick with this moving average, rolling average. It won't take three seconds, hopefully. So, from this row, I look at row two through row twenty-two, and that average comes up to four. And hopefully, these come out to a different. And as you see. There's nothing through here that actually makes it jump up enough. But then we scroll down to here, and you can tell in row, row 22, we can skip down to row 32, and there's a big jumper out there. Now I can make it whatever number I need to. I can say if, let's say, one guy comes in one week and says, we want 100 above and 
47 below. You just have to change one thing and <coughs> quickly find this average. As you see, it works just fine. I can show you through Excel. That it does actually calculate correctly, but hopefully everyone kind of understands that. All right, so let's go back up here. Uh, let's see. Which part were you talking about, Bresh? The for reverse rolling total? Let's keep it simple here and uh, just not the reverse one. The simple so the thing was that when we are using the running totals, right? Oh, you mean with this one? Yeah. So why are we using running totals, uh, not just the totals? Um, that was just to show that you can do a a, a run a like a rolling total. So yeah. There's the the difference. Truthfully, when you just look at this one. Um, Customer is not, but when you start looking at all customers, then you get you can see that the the customer it starts rolling uh, pretty significantly, especially some of these with the way more than four or five different like this one, where there's lots of data. Mm -hmm. You can see that it, it adds this one. Sorry, this one adds together a lot. That's well, I think one. there is there is something that is uh, not possibly clear for uh, this person. So let's move on for now. And in the interest of time, it's about twelve thirty-six now. So we'll we'll try to answer that uh, once we have time in the end. Or you can possibly she can tweet to you or email you or the best way. Right? Thanks. Yep. No problem. All right. So now let's go back to our demo screen. All right, so SQL 2012 actually brought eight new windowing functions as well, besides just our little aggregate uh, functions. Uh, they, they're, they brought into two groups. So the first one is offset, which are these four functions, lag lead, uh, where you grab Lag, you grab one field from the previous row. Lead, you grab one field from a later row. First value, you grab one field from the first row. Last value, you grab one field from the last row. Pretty simple. Very basic um, offset functions. All right. The other group is distribution. So these are more uh, statistical things you'll have to deal with. Um, percent rank, which is just the relative rank percent wise. Um, percentile discrete, uh, percentile continuous, and a cumulative distribution. Um, I'll go on into a little bit more detail on what they are in my demos for those, which comes up right now. I know y'all are excited. So first, let's go into the offset function. All right, first thing we'll do. Um, okay, so for this one, we're, we want to start off with just a basic thing. Um, we're used to some of this, these, this concept of how we're showing all of our windowing functions. Lag, and then we tell what field exactly we want to grab from a previous row, and we want to go over partition by customer ID, order by sales order ID. So we're just gonna be showing in this case, the last sales order ID using the lag function. So the last row for this customer, last time this customer came in, this is the sales order they had. With the lead, we show it the next sales order they had. And you'll notice in here, obviously, uh, for customer 11,000, uh, but the first time they came in, there is no last sales order ID, so this will show us no. The next sales order ID comes from here. June 20th, they came in, so we can have the last sales order ID is showing what's, what happened last time, and next sales order ID, what happens next time. And it go, it'll go through the entire thing of 
health, however that came in. And so the last one and the next one every time. So, so yeah, the way it, as I say here in my comment, it's kind of like a linked list if you're familiar with that. Um, and that's, that's really all there is for this function itself. It's pretty, pretty safe. Um, it works fairly well. Um, the thing to remember is it a little different than the other two, the other group of functions we looked at before. It does show uh, sales order. It does have to have a, something in this column or it won't know what to grab. Um, both lag and lead, it does need that. That's how easy this one is. There's not a lot of difference here. So let's move on a little different, a little harder, and not too much. In this case, um, I'm actually showing the days since their last order and the days until their next order. So this could be very useful, as we all know, in, in some CRMs to show the last time that the um, we got a purchase from these people. Um, or the next, in some cases, the next time we get a purchase from them. The only difference here is in how it actually is, is uh, formatted. Uh, this function is all together here. Uh, we use our normal date diff function to see the number of days and until between that and order date on our current row. Fairly basic, nothing too, nothing too crazy here, hopefully. Uh, as you you get to play with it, you'll see there's not anything magic about this one. All right, so now this is the one I actually kind of like to see because there's there's a number of times I want to skip ahead. I don't want to show what's on the next row. I want to show two or three rows down. Well, that's where this deep, this optional parameter here, because um, we used to before is just we would see it right here. We would see in the in the parameter. Uh, in this case, we want to actually show a little more because we're telling it to skip two rows down, and we want to show actually a default parameter. If in case we're at these nulls, we want to show it. We want to show the value of one one two thousand. So if we go back to orders, obviously the first time there's nothing. Even the second time, there's nothing to show except for our default parameter. Then there's something to show this next time. Same thing for forward two orders. Works the same way, just in reverse. So this does do with lead. Something I do like to bring up, we don't have to give it a default, just a string. It doesn't have to do that. We can do, we can do get date. This works just as well. So we can show the last, if there is nothing to show, It'll be today. Or you can do date add and add one day to it. Yeah, there's, there's, it's limitless what you can do. Uh, also with us, we can change it to four, a hundred, whatever you want a number you want to show, but that one does allow any number in there, or uh, any integer in there. That's the important part. It does have to be an integer. All right. Hopefully everybody kind of got lag and lead down. Those are pretty simple. All right. So first value. First value we're kind of used to from seeing above. There's the first value, the, the fill we want to grab. So we just want to grab the order date. So in this case, what we're going to do is grab the first time that an, a customer came in and ordered with us. All right. So for customer 11,000, there's only three rows again. Uh, if there is a question slash suggestion, I think. Give me one sec. I can't have both of them open at the same time. I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So he had a question about the running total earlier, and the jury has apparently found it. So I think he should be all set. Good. Cool. Sorry, man. I read it as a question. Sorry. It's all good. It's all good. I'd rather you ask questions than not. All right, for first order date, we're good. It shows the first time that the person ordered. All right, so last value kind of works the same. We do select, same thing, the only thing we've changed here is from first value to last value. If you look through here, it's exactly the same thing. 
except comes up here, it doesn't quite work because the last order date is the same date as our current row because we've ordered it by customer and sales order ID. So something obviously is wrong here, except it's not. If you remember back to what we showed before, it can only look, it by default, it only looks at the current row and anything above. So last row, last value, you always have to put in rows between current row and unbounded following. That's the trick to remember for last value. Once you do that, this works just exactly like you expect it to. As you see for customer 11,000, the last row, last order they have is from 10-3-2013. And that's what we have every time here. That, that's, that's a big gotcha that most people that even use the last value or any of these windowing functions of frequently will forget until you see it and you run it and you're like, oh, I should have done that. So that's why I bring it up so that hopefully you'll remember at least this presentation and think, oh, that's why that error is coming up. Let's go through that. All right. So I'm gonna go over to distribution functions here and talk about this, this last group uh, for our set. So with this row, I'm using, I'm doing through two different functions, the cumulative distribution and percent rank. Uh, the value of current shows, by, as, as I put in this comment to make it a little easier for everyone. Uh, the value returned by cumulative distribution shows the percent of employees that have a salary less than or equal to the current employee in the same department. So let's actually just run this. You'll see the difference here between the two. They're they're pretty close in what they actually show. But let's let's focus here on document control. For document control, Arfin here, last his last name, um, he has the he has paid the most out of the entire department. So he gets 100% um, both cumulative distribution and percent rank. Uh, this last person, uh, both of these actually, uh, get paid the same amount. So they are in the bottom uh, group of the department. Percent rank, they get shown as zero percent. So they're, they're actually, show, this shows them at the bottom as being zero. Where cumulative distribution wise, there's a number other than zero. That's the big difference between the two. And for the most part, though, there's nothing else between the two that most of us will have to remember until you get real down into the depths of what is showing for this, uh, these two functions. That's the real difference. Cumulative distribution shows a number other than zero for the very last one. Percent rank shows zero. All right. So now, we have the last two here. All right. So percentile continuous is based on continuous distribution. Um, the, the main thing here is result is interpolated. It may not be equal to any specific values in the column where percentile is discrete. It actually returns an actual value. So let's run these two. You see the only difference here. What I want to do is actually find the median employee. So I'll put 0.5 in for the function here. And it, and you see here, the function, the, it shows a little different. The difference here is within group order by rate. Um, these are the only two that have this, this within group function. Uh, so you won't use it that often, but for these two, you have to know it or you will not get the correct answer. Uh, then it has our normal function we're used to, the over partition by this, order by that. All right. So as you see here, if you look at this, this data, for just for human resources, and that's all we're going to look at on this one, or you can look at all the other departments on your own. Um, for the median, which means the halfway point between the two, not the average, but Median, which means uh, for anyone who is not up on your statistics, 
uh, definitions. Median is uh, the point, the midpoint between all values where 50% of the, the values are above and 50% of the values are below. So that's what this one is trying to show for median. Um, you have to use these two uh, functions for median itself. That's the easiest way to get to them. The only way to get to them, nothing else actually shows median. So for median continuous, the value we show here is 17.442785, which is not one of these values. So it is the what what is happening on this one? It finds the midpoint is shows it between these two. So since there are six values, it shows we'll look between point three and point four, which is these two, and just average them. That's that's all they do for finding the median for those. Median discrete, on the other hand, actually shows what it has determined is the of these existing values, which one is the actual uh, midpoint, which one we want to stay with. In this case, it picked 16.5865. And that's those two functions. Um, there are obviously several different ways you want to play around with that. And I found this actual um, website several years ago. It's done from 2013, as you see here by the date. It, this one goes through and shows exactly how percentile continuous is uh, figured out. Um, it goes nice Excel spreadsheets, and you can play with it. Uh, it shows really well in depth on what goes on to create these functions. And that's that for that group. Now, Fresh, do we have any other questions? No, man. So one of the things that I can share is that um, the first few functions that you talked about, row number and all that, that yep. is actually workable in literally any flavor of SQL. I'm not sure of the last few, like the percentile continuous and so on. I don't know that, but uh, I've been using, I've seen people use that in Oracle. I've seen people use the same exact thing in Redshift. That is what I work on currently in AWS. So yes, guys, so this knowledge is a core knowledge and you should be able to use it almost anywhere, uh, buying a few things here and there that might need to be changed. So. Um, right. Yeah, as always, make sure to check with your um, whatever flavor of SQL you're working with. Um, make sure the the syntax is correct, but this this the windowing functions themselves should work the exact same everywhere. So with that, I like my last little query here. This set of uh, queries here, we actually go and I show how they're useful these can be. All right, so first one we're going to look at again at the AdventureWorks 2014 database. Um, let's find the first row of each postal code for this table. I know business users always come up with strange things they want to find out. This one just wanted to find whatever the postal code, the first time a postal code is actually given. How would you do this otherwise? Who knows? There's there's 37 ways we could do cursors, loop through this all kinds of times, find this, find that. Let's use a windowing function. Let's make it simple. So as I showed before, um, we do our basic row number um, for the postal code 01071. We use, we do the partition. Um, and then next time, next time I change, this changes the value. Then we go to the next one. We start again with one. So now I'm only looking at where row number equals one. And it's as we see here, make it simple. All right. So now if we wanted to show the last row uh, by address ID that has this partition as this postal code, the only thing we have to change is that. That's about as smooth as it can get between those two. And you see it's 
change dramatically um, the address ID. Pretty simple. I, I, this is this function and I use, like I said earlier, I use this at least once a day, if not more. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them I'm going to answer myself if possible. Will these functions have any impact on performance? Oh yeah, you'll really do much better because the SQL Server query engine is actually designed to handle functions rather than subqueries because when you run the subqueries, the context kind of loses to what am I applying this execution plan to. So yes, it will affect it in a positive way. And the other one is something I don't know. The on, Can I, I want to talk about that one for a minute. Because yeah, give me one sec, one sec though. And the other one is possibly, can you use these windowing functions in SSRS expressions? Oh, we can take one at a time. So let, let's go back to the first one there. Um, sure. The When I try to use these functions, the, the first few in, that were available since SQL 20, 20, 2005, I have never seen any performance hit at all on those, especially row number. I don't get any hit at all. Now, when I use the SQL 2012 ones, the ones that were lag lead, first value, last value, and the, the statistic ones, oh yeah, I'll, I'll see a hit. Um, as always, check to make sure it works how you think it will or how bad the hit is all the time. It's important. But there is there is a slight hit. Um, at worst, you go back to doing it another way. Um, but depending on how, how, how big the entire um, data set is, you may want to change. So just something to keep in mind. And will this be used uh, in TempDB? I don't believe so. That is a question. Um, I don't. I think it does on, when the order by things are used. If it's just partition, I do not believe it hits it. I will have to actually check that out to make sure. Yes, um, so that's but, the question. We can post the answer to uh, on our website or uh, through the notes. So the questions, the questions will be uh, shared at, along with the recording. So I think this entire transcript will be posted there and we can take it from there, right? Awesome. Cool. All right, so let me go through and answer, show this last query out that I truly do love. Okay. So All right. So 57 now, and yes, we still didn't answer if this, uh, these functions can be used with SSRS expressions. Yes. Okay. Yes, they can, actually. Um, you have to do a little bit of work to get it to work in, within SSRS natively, but you can make it work. Okay, great. All right, so finding the gaps in the address ID for this table. All right, so I'm going to show the basic query here. In person address, start the address ID starts at 1 and ends at 32,521, and there's only 19,614. That means somewhere it's jumped at least once. I know I don't feel like drop getting this into Excel and doing some manipulations and do this, that, and other. Heck with that. Let's do it the easy way. Let's use windowing functions. So with that, I can tell you pretty quickly there's three jump, three, three actual gaps. All I've done here is and if you run this subquery here, which I will. All right, so I want to show an address ID looking at the next row, see what its address ID is, which, show, which shows the next RM. I then look to see the next address minus the address it is, and where the difference is not one, then that's when I show it here in this group. That is the quickest way I've ever seen to do gap analysis. And I, whenever I do gap analysis, this is what I use. It's quick. As you see, it took like, it didn't even take a second on my machine. It's awesome. that simple. So it's uh, 12.59. Any parting words, uh, Kev? Yep, let me show my little last screen here uh, on yeah. the presentation. 
Um, as we were talking earlier, there are two books I like to recommend. Uh, one is by Kathy Kellenberger, Aunt Kathy, as some people may know her on tip Twitter, especially. Uh, Expert T-SQL window functions in SQL Server. And Itzik Ben-Gan's Microsoft SQL Server 2012 High Performance T-SQL Using Window Functions. Very in-depth. You will learn more than you ever needed to know about either of those two. So with that, if you actually want to do some examples, I actually have some up on my website, on this website. Uh, this web, the URL right here shows exactly where you can go to find it. Uh, so with that, if you have any questions, you can always reach me at SherpaData.com, which is my website. I do all kinds of things. Um, most of them is actually based on SQL. Hit me up on LinkedIn, Twitter, or email. And Lord knows I'll be able to answer any fine questions any of y'all have. Um, and you can hit me up. Um, and with that, I give it back to Paresh. Paresh, do you have any final questions before we let all the wonderful people go? No, I think you did amazingly well, man. I mean, I have, I was actually, I'm in the middle of reading uh, it six uh, book myself. And I find that this one was a shortcut through that entire book now. Sorry, it's sick. I love your book anyways. So having said that, yes, guys, if you are in the Boston area, remember the Boston SQL Saturday is on the 28th of March. Uh, I believe there might only be about 10 feet of snow on the ground yet, but yeah, definitely feel free to join us, right? And uh, I would love to see and everybody saying thank you, thank you, thank you. And will the scripts be available? Yes, the scripts will be available. The recording of this entire session will be available and his PowerPoint will also be available for anyone who is interested. Give us about 24 hours, we shall do the needful. So thank you everyone for joining us and wherever you are, have a good night, good afternoon or good evening. And we will catch up with you at the next time around. And Leela from Minneapolis says it was an awesome webinar. Thank you so much. Cool guys, bye. Thanks. Thanks bud, see you soon. <laughs> bye. <laughs>